get through the chapter. If not, then we'll just cover it in two weeks. So we'll see. I entitled it A Collection for the Saints. And that's kind of how the chapter opens. It seems to be kind of the main idea. And then after that, there's just a bunch of instructions. So I could have entitled it A Collection for the Saints and Final Instructions. But um, we'll see where we get to this, 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 this morning. But anyway, um, Paul is giving some final instructions as he's finishing off the first letter of Corinthians. And it's interesting that even though there are various instructions given in the last portion of the last chapter here, it gives us a good glimpse of how Paul behaves himself in ministry, how he makes schedules, and so forth. So it, it gives us a little bit of an of a insight uh, into that. It, it gives us insight in the fact that Christianity is not an idea in the air. You know, it's just, you know, just kind of floating around an idea in the air, but it's having both feet on the ground. It's very spiritual, but yet it's very practical. And um, Paul has been talking about the resurrection there in chapter 15, and I think that in light of the fact that there is a resurrection, that there is such a thing as Christ coming back for us um, should cause us to live with both feet on the ground and to be practical and to be active as believers. I was uh, talking to Ronald this past week, and we were talking about doing an outreach, uh, and he was saying, you know, <clears throat> doing an, out, an outside outreach, we should plan it for the dry season because that's practical. See, it's not practical to plan a, an outreach, an outdoor outreach in July when you have the most rain and then expect God to push, push the rain around. God can do that, but it's not practical. It's not the way it works. You don't just close your brain and then just kind of, you know, I don't know, just daydream. You know, that's not the way it works. It's, it's practical. You, you, make, you make a plan and then you move forward and then you allow God to direct. And so, but opening this letter, Paul opens it up with a collection. And so he goes from the, the resurrection to the collection. And Paul desires that they collect some money for the Gentile, uh, that the Gentile churches collect some money to assist the church in Jerusalem, which is going through a tough time at this period of time. And the question is, why is Jerusalem, why are the church there going through a difficult time? It could be a couple reasons. One is because we see in Acts chapter 11 that Agabus made a prophecy that there was going to be a famine in Judea in that area. So it's possible that that is why he asked for they were going through a difficult time and so they needed a collection. The other thing it could be that the entire economy in Jerusalem revolved around the temple. Somehow, almost everything related to the temple. Uh, the sheep, the offering, uh, people working, maintaining the temple, people coming from all over Jerusalem or, or, or Israel to worship in that place. There were hotels, there were resorts, there were all these things. Everything kind of revolved around the temple. So what happens when people come to Christ and they begin to teach the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus? And who ran the temple? The Sadducees. The Sadducees were in control of the temple, and they were the liberals, and they did not believe in the resurrection. See, So it's possible that the Sadducees began to fire the workers of the Christians because they were teaching a different teaching and hoping to push them and convert them back to Judaism. Also, the third thing that could have been part of the reason is because after Pentecost, the people stayed around in Jerusalem. They just kind of stuck around. They didn't go home. They went from all these countries. They came to Jerusalem during Pentecost. And after that, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they just kind of stayed there. They, they were excited about the church, the birth of the church. And so what happened is that the people began to pull together their assets. They began to sell their properties and feed the people that stayed there and the widows. So maybe the finances of the church were depleted. So it could have been all three of them combined that caused the church to become really poor and really needy. 
And so Paul, Paul is concerned about the church. And it's a little bit interesting, though, that, that Paul personally, he's busy starting churches, he's busy preaching the gospel. He could have just sent someone else. But yet he personally wants to go to Jerusalem and drop off the collection. I, I don't know why exactly that is the case. I'm, I'm kind of interested Paul wants to do that. But it seems that Paul never really bonded very well with the leadership in Jerusalem. Because the, the people in Jerusalem, those who were leading like James and, and, and even Peter and all these other guys that were in Jerusalem seem to be a little bit more traditional. They seem to be a little bit more, well, I guess, kind of, a, a, a Jude, uh, kind of an Old Testament overtone in that, in that church. And um, just a little bit closer to the Old Testament rituals. And Paul was the opposite. He was willing to embrace the Gentiles to bring everyone into the church. And he didn't have these issues. And, and the other thing, we know that Paul persecuted the church paul said i wasted the church that's his own words and maybe paul wants to say you know what? i wasted the church i persecuted the church i'd love to be a blessing to them and show to them that that i really care for them and bring them a gift and so beginning in verse one it says now current concerning the collection for the saints as i have given orders to the church of galatia so you must do also notice the word saints. He's referring to saints as living Christians, not dead ones. Not Saint Mary or Saint Paul or Saint, you know, Joseph. But he's referring to Christians as saints. If you are a believer, you fall into the category of a saint. Saint William. See, that Matt, Saint William, that, that works. Saint Rudy doesn't really work that well. But Saint William, you know, Saint whoever. But saints, if you are a believer, you are a saint. And so he calls the Christians saints, not only maybe because they were saints, but also as a form of unifying the gentle church with the, Jude with the, with the Jewish church. Saints, you're all saints, whether you are a Gentile or whether you are a Jew. Saints, a collection, the saints are to bring, or Christians are to bring a collection for the saints. Um, <clears throat> and so thinking here of the fact that um, bringing, making this collection not only because they were poor and I think there's another reason why Paul might have wanted to do a collection and feeling that it was right and that is that salvation is of the Jews see the reason why the Gentiles were having the benefit and the blessing of God in their life and being saved was because of the Jew. Because Jesus was a Jew. The Bible says in Romans, that, or, or in, in John chapter 4, that salvation is of the Jews. So salvation came first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So the Gentiles are, are now being blessed because of the Messiah. So, hey, you were blessed spiritually, so it's right for you to give back financially to the church because they are in need at this point in time. You know, the Bible says that we are to help the poor. To, to do a collection was the right thing to do. Help the poor. That is something that a church is not just suggested to help in, but commanded. We are to help the poor. And when we help the poor, we need to be wise in how we go about it. You can help someone that needs help, is financially down, but you need to be wise because the reason he's financially down might be because he's in drugs or he's alcoholic or he's plain lazy, just doesn't want to work. And in that case, it's not wise to give the resources that God has given you to manage to help someone that will just waste it. So it is, we need to be wise in how we go about it. We need to be discerning. I was reading, sorry, I was reading short, uh, recently a report of the European Union is giving millions and millions of dollars in aid to the farmers in Africa every year. And it seems that it's a good thing, right? They're helping the poor. But they're saying that in the long term, it has actually caused more damage than good. And the reason is because the farmers are beginning to rely on foreign aid. 
and they're not being creative themselves in learning how to cultivate and make a living and farm themselves. They're completely dependent now on foreign aid. If the foreign aid would stop coming in, they'd starve to death. So we need to be wise in how we help the poor. It's not always just in the form of a dollar, though that is often the case, but not always. <clears throat> it can be different ways how we need to help the poor. But the church is responsible to insist and help the poor. So, now concerning the collection for the saints that are poor in Jerusalem. As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Notice that the first day of the week. <clears throat> that is Sunday, right? The church met on the first day of the week. Now some people ask, and I was asked recently again, why did the Christians change the Sabbath? Now I have some people working for me who are Seventh-day Adventists, and they ask me, well, how about the Sabbath? Why are we not worshiping on the Sabbath, and why did the Christians change that? Let me tell you something. The Christians never changed the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. It's still the Sabbath today. And Sunday is still Sunday today. Nobody changed the Sabbath, and nobody changed the Sunday. They, they, they remain the same. Um, I, I think, truly, we don't know really what day is Saturday today. If you look at the calendar and the way that some of the issues that are back and, and dating, we not, we're not totally sure that what we call Saturday today is actually Saturday. It, it could be Sunday or it could be Tuesday. We don't know exactly. There's, 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 there's some debate about that. But anyway, bottom line, Saturday, there was traditionally... Worshipping on Saturday, and now they're worshipping on Sunday. And why is that the case? And the question is there. Why, why did they do that? Well, number one, because Jesus rose on Sunday. Okay, that's number one. Number two, Pentecost happened on Sunday. The church was birthed on Sunday. Not Saturday, but on Sunday. So, the first day of the week. And for that reason, it seems that the church began to celebrate and to worship the Lord on Sunday, because that is when the church was born, and that is when Jesus rose from the dead. So they came together on the birthday of these two main events that really produced the church. And then, Paul says, when it comes to Saturday and Sunday, it was already an issue back in that day, he says that each one, or it says in Romans 14, one person esteems one day above another, and another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. So each day is proper to worship the Lord. doesn't matter if it's on Sunday or it's on Saturday. It's not wrong to worship the Lord on Saturday. It's not wrong to worship the Lord on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. Every day is alike. Let each one be convinced in his own mind. So if you think it's Saturday, then that's fine. If you think it's Sunday, that's fine. You know, for me, I think it's every day. And uh, that's fine. Paul says, let each one be convinced of his own mind. Don't argue about it. Did you know if you read church history that the early fathers already said that the norm for the church was to meet on Sunday, the first day of the week? That was norm. Already, like, the church really, the church fathers already mentioned that. So it happened from right at the time of Jesus. They already began to worship on Sunday. Also, the scripture never in the New Testament commands the church to keep the Sabbath. You will never read in the New Testament one place where the church is commanded to keep the Sabbath. You can go through all the Ten Commandments and you'll see them reiterated in the New Testament. You shall not steal. Yep, it's in the New Testament. You shall not lie. It's in the New Testament. You shall honor mother and father in the New Testament. You shall not commit adultery in the New Testament. But not, you, shall not keep, you shall keep the Sabbath. That is not in the New Testament. You will not find it. It was never commanded to the church. Um, also, the Sabbath, it, backing up just a little bit, the church at one point had an issue in that people came from Jerusalem and they began to preach that you need to keep the Sabbath. You need to be circumcised and you need to keep the Sabbath. And there was a real issue with them. And they had a run with Paul and Paul had you know, real problems with these guys. And so Paul went back to Jerusalem and there was a first church council where they discussed 
the issue of circumcision and the issue of worshiping on the Sabbath. And the church together, the church fathers came together and they, they gave some rules to the church. And this is what they said. Keep yourself from immorality and strangle meat and love the Lord. That's it. That's what they never instructed them to keep the Sabbath. So it's not in the New Testament. It's just simply not there, that concept. Also, the Sabbath was given as a sign to Moses. Before Moses, the Jews did not keep the Sabbath. See, Noah, Adam, all these guys didn't know about the Sabbath. So if that was that important, why wasn't it given to them? It wasn't. It was only given to Moses for that period of time for the Jews. Um, and, and if we look at the New Testament and the Old Testament, certain things have changed. For example, the rituals at the temple. Today, we have no temple. We are the temple. See, that has changed. In the Old Testament, you had priests at the temple. The Bible says today that we are the priests. We are a royal priesthood that has changed. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the sign of faith. Today, baptism is the outward sign of faith. In the Old Testament, the Sabbath was foreshadowing the rest that we would have in Jesus. Today, we experience that rest in Jesus. In the Old Testament, Sabbath commemorates a finished creation. In the New Testament, the first day of the week commemorates finished redemption. So, really, I think let each one be persuaded in his own mind. Personally, I, I think there's no issue. The Bible doesn't teach that. We need to keep the Sabbath. It's not even there. If you just open-mindedly study the Scriptures. But the Bible says still let each one be persuaded in his own mind. So, each day is alike. Don't argue about it. What is important is that you worship the Lord. <laughs> that's, what's, that's, that's the key. So, in the first day of the week, when you come together... Um, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Storing up as he may prosper. See, give in accordance to your income. You know, when you make a lot more, you can give more. If you make less, you give less. That's, that's, that's the way it works. So that there be no collection when I come. Paul didn't want to come off as an offering taker. You know, I think too often today, churches... They make way too much emphasis on, on, on collections of money. I think that's a big deal in the church to collect money. And um, that is one of the reasons why in this church we never make that an issue. We don't, we don't talk about money a lot. We don't, that's not the main deal. The main thing is that we serve the Lord, worship Him, come together. And then, obviously, as your heart is transformed, you give to the Lord. Obviously, because I think that... Um, Your checkbook does say something about where your heart is. The Bible says where your, where your uh, treasure is, there your heart is also. So I think your checkbook does reveal a little bit of where your heart is. But it's not up to me to fleece people and beg for money. And man, you know, ministry is going to go down if you don't give. And, and it just, you know, that's just not, that's just not, Paul didn't want any of that. He said, you know what, you make the collection before I come. When I get there, I don't want to talk about money. And so, but giving is important because it's, it, it reveals our heart, it reveals generosity. And Jesus was generous. Jesus gave. He gave his son. We might say, well, I'll just pray for you. You know, I'll pray for you. Well, yeah, but James says, what does it profit if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food? And one of you says, depart in peace, be warm, be filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? See, if you see a needy person, he's, he needs clothes. And, oh, you know, God bless you. And may he give you clothes. And you, you, know, you have clothes. You could give it to him. If you don't, what does it profit? It doesn't profit anything. So we need to be practical again. That, that's, that's the key. We need to be practical. Second Corinthians 9 also speaks of giving. It says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful 
giver. So give cheerfully. Don't give grudgingly. If you cannot give like happily, then don't give. Just keep the money for yourself. Spend it on your own. But if you can give it cheerfully, then give it to the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And um, so, Martin Luther said there are three conversions that are necessary in a man. Number one, the conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the conversion of the pocketbook. And the third can be the hardest. That's what he says. So, if you sow sparingly, well, you will reap sparingly. It's just, it's just the law that is there. It's very practical. Verse 3, And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Paul didn't say, you guys make the collection, and then I'll take it to Jerusalem. He didn't say that. He says, you make a collection, and you pick people that will go with me to Jerusalem. Do you see that? Accountability. Accountability. He didn't just slap the money bag in his, in his back and go to Jerusalem. He could have been blamed that, hey, not all the money came to Jerusalem, and Paul, where, where's the money? No, he didn't do that. There was accountability. When we started this church, and uh, there was you know, some needs, and so we had a collection box, and people could put in money. I told you know, the guy who was, was you know, kind of uh, next to me, I told him, you know, I don't want to be able to, I don't have any access to the money of this church. I don't even want to be able to sign a coupon or a check on behalf of the church. Today, I cannot sign for the church. I have no access to any money in this church. And I purposely did that. I never want to be blamed that I misspent money or I took money. I, I don't have access to the money. And so I purposely did that. <clears throat> and, and the other thing, I'm a type of person I like to work. I don't like to be dependent on someone else. So I worked, sustained myself, and pastored a church. Even though the church does pay me a little bit, but, um, but mostly I sustain myself. I like it that way. That's just who I am. And I don't like to beg for money or, or you know, make a big deal of it. And, 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 and God doesn't either. God doesn't either. The main thing is to feed the flock, feed the sheep. And when you feed them and they're really, really healthy, then their heart will be in the right place and they'll give. See, that's the way it works. You don't force a person to give because his heart is wrong. It doesn't work that way. You, you, you feed him first, and then when he's really healthy, then he'll begin to act in a healthy way. That's kind of the way it works. So verse 5, Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. Notice that? I'm passing through Macedonia. Paul doesn't say, you know, I'm getting up in the morning, I'm just kind of like saying, oh God, whatever you have for me today, you know, it's just going to see what's going to happen. Paul didn't do that. He had, a, he had a plan. He got up and he had a plan. Okay, I'm passing through Macedonia. I've been through the ch churches of Galatia, and I'm moving in that direction. I'm going to stop by your place. And then he says, if the Lord permits. See? He made a plan. He, he, he knew what he had in mind. He had a vision. He probably wrote it down on paper. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. This is my schedule for the next six months. If the Lord permits. See? You give the Lord editing rights over your, over your plans. This is my plan. This is what I believe God wants me to do. It's very practical, but you give him the editing rights. He can change it if he wants to. You have to remain flexible. You know, someone told me, <clears throat> I was at a wedding, and, and um, they, the pastor who was doing a wedding at the time had written down his prayer. So he, he kind of prayed, and you could see he was reading his prayer. And I heard, overheard someone behind me saying, that is not spiritual. Because he wrote down his prayer. Let me ask you a question. If I write down my prayer, that I'm going to pray tomorrow at some event, does God not know today what I need to pray tomorrow? <laughs> See? Some people have told me I, don't, sh I shouldn't have notes. I, I'm, I'm a type of person, I have a lot of notes. And I shouldn't have notes when I preach because that's not spiritual. Because I am, I am uh, kind of, you know... Uh, uh, 
dampening the Holy Spirit. He, 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 because I, I wrote things down, I, just, I must just kind of get up and just speak. You know, that's stupid. <laughs> no, you, you don't just get up and speak. That is why some people have to yell really loud, because they have nothing to say. See, that is why you study to show yourself approved. You go home and you study. You study the book. You study what's written. You, you look at the Hebrew and the Greek. And you look at context and application and all these things. And you, 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 you put down, you put a sermon together. Otherwise, you're just wasting the people's time. And so, very practical. Very practical. But we, we give God the editing rights. See, it's like riding a bicycle. You don't just pray, oh, God, teach me to ride the bicycle, you know, and you just kind of like, well, just sit here and whatever, see what God's going to do. No, it doesn't work that way. You get on the bicycle and you ride it. See, you're going to fall sometimes, but you get up again and you keep going. And as you do that, God can direct you. He can lead you. He can teach you and, and so forth, but you have to get moving. You have to walk. You have to move. And so that's the way it is spiritually. You just have to, to do it. And as you do it, God will lead and direct and show you more. So, verse 8, it says, But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. I will tarry in Ephesus. See, Paul is writing this letter from Ephesus, and he says, you know what? I'm going to stay around for just a little while longer. The longest stay that Paul stayed at any location at one time was Ephesus. He stayed there for almost three years, and Ephesus was a beautiful place. Even today, when you go to Ephesus, it's a beautiful place. It's, I'm amazed when you look at... Today we think that things are modern, and maybe they are in terms of we have more modern equipment that we would consider modern. You know, we have, you know, engines, we have electricity, we have computers, we have all these stuff. But back in the day, their architecture was amazing. It's just incredible. Even today in Ephesus, and I walked in the very streets that Paul walked there in Ephesus, and the mosaics, I mean, the whole pavement, was just, it was all mosaics. It's amazing. You feel like you shouldn't even step on this stuff. Even today, you can see it there. And... Um, the signs that were at, at junctions, and you come to this, there are signs engraved, and the library that was there is even standing to this day. It's just amazing how beautiful it is. The amphitheater that is there, um, that, that Paul was in, is still standing there today, and it's, it's just a beautiful place. And so Paul says, you know, I'm, I'm going to stay in this place for a while because a great and effective door has opened to me. See, Paul was preaching the gospel. Um, Aquila and Priscilla came from Corinth and he, they, they began to preach the gospel there as well. They started a church in their home. And so Paul was really being effective in that place. In fact, he was so effective. The door was so wide open for the gospel that the people were turning away from serving these, this goddess Diana. Today, when you walk into Ephesus, the old city of Ephesus, and you walk in there and you walk through the first amphitheater and then you go a little bit further up and then you see the statue of the goddess Diana. It's one ugly statue. It's, it's a lady with a bunch of breasts, and it was a fertility, fertility god, and that's what they were serving. And so he had all these silversmiths that were making the statues of the goddess Diana. But now that people are coming to Christ because Paul's preaching the gospel, the silversmiths, they look at, you know, their sales, and our sales are down 20% this month, they're down 30% down this month, and it just keeps going down, and what's the problem? Paul is the problem. He's preaching the gospel, and they're no longer worshiping these, these, these statues. And so they were really, you know, they, they, they incited a riot. And they all ran into the amphitheater, and for three hours they cried out. For three hours they cried, great is the goddess Diana. Nobody knew why he had even come. It was just turmoil in that place. And um, so there was opposition. A great door had opened, but there was opposition. You know, we were in Ephesus, <clears throat> we walked into the amphitheater, and, and, and we had church there that, that day. Um, it was a preaching, and then we were singing. And then someone came into the amphitheater and said, we had to stop. We cannot, we cannot sing gospel songs in this place. See, it's in Turkey, and it's predominantly Muslim, and so they hated the idea of Christian songs. So they said, you can't sing that. Interesting that 
Paul had opposition, <laughs> we had opposition even now, 2,000 years later, just singing in that same amphitheater. But, um, but, but, but when there's an effective door and you're being successful and the Lord is using the, you, then there is opposition. There is adversaries. If you have no opposition, maybe you are not effective. You're not making a dent in Satan's kingdom. John Wesley, who has traveled a lot on horseback, he had been traveling for a couple days, and he hadn't faced any opposition. He began like, I'm, this is weird. I'm used to real hard opposition. So he got off his horse, and he prayed, and he got back up, and somebody was throwing rocks at him. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm back on track again, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> G. Campbell Morgan said this, if you have no opposition in the, in the place where you are serving, then you're serving in the wrong place. So... Serving the Lord, there will be opposition. Satan does not like it when you are effective for God. Verse 10, And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Why would he say that? Well, maybe because Timothy was really young. He was a little bit timid. He was a little bit afraid. So, you know, accept him. The other thing is because there were so many false teachers going through the churches those days and fleecing the church that the church was becoming really suspicious of anyone that came to the church they were really suspicious why what are these guys doing here well why are they here and so paul says no timothy is okay you know accept him you know i think even today we need to be really really careful who we allow to speak in the church i, I guard this pulpit someone comes here and says i want to preach i'm not gonna allow him to preach unless i know these people Unless they've been recommended, and I know somebody knows them really well. Others, I, I guard this pulpit. I will not allow anybody to preach here just because they mention the name Jesus or Holy Spirit. Oh, you mentioned Holy Spirit, so you can preach now. No, no. no you, you, have, you, you have to make sure that these people preach and teach the truth, the gospel. And so Paul, Timothy was one of them, so accept him. He's, he's okay. As Paul said, verse 11, Therefore let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our, our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Do you notice that? Paul, he said to Apollos, you know Apollos, come with me, let's go. And Apollos was quite unwilling, he said. He tried to persuade him, but he said, no, I'm not going to go. This shows us how Paul handled ministry. Paul didn't say, I'm Paul. I am the apostle. If I say something, you do it. He didn't say that. He gave Apollos the freedom to refuse. He says, you know, why don't we go? I think it would be a good idea. And Paul says, no, I don't feel. I feel I should stay here. And Paul respected that. See, as a pastor, we should be really careful not to dictate or control people or manipulate people. It's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to teach the gospel and to realize that, yes, I have the Holy Spirit and living in me, but so do you. See, so do you. I hear from God, but so do you. And so I need to respect that. I can say, you know, from my perspective, you know, I kind of think this might be a good thing, but, but, but if you feel God is not saying that, then that's fine. Don't you know, so we should not, not dictate or control people in any way. Verse 13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, and be strong. See, it was hard being a, a, a Christian in, in Corinth. And so he urged them to stay strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia. Remember, Paul once said, I, have bapt I don't remember having baptized anyone except the household of Stephanus. Um, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus for Donatus and Achaicus for what was lacking on your part they supplied. For they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. See, there are always people like that around, and there's such a blessing. Verse 18, for they refresh my spirit. There are people, when you hang out with them, 
you're like so encouraged after you've been, been with these guys. It's like, oh man, it's so fun to hang out with these people. And then there's those that just aren't quite that refreshing, you know. <laughs> so, so let's try to be those who are refreshing. And then verse 19, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. See that? They started a church in the house. So many churches, even today, are started in houses. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I don't know. I don't like that one. <laughs> but it says a holy kiss. All right? So don't get ideas. Don't ah, there's a girl over there. I'm going to, you know. No. It's, it's, it's a holy kiss. It was, it, was, it was a way of showing affection in that day. It was normal. It was okay back in that day. And so it was, it, was, it was a cultural thing. So Paul says, you know, show affection to one another. That's fine. So that was, and that day, today might be a hug uh, and so forth. This, this salutation with my own hand. So Paul had a scribe who wrote for him, but then Paul signed it off. If anyone does not love the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. That phrase, O Lord, come, is the word in Greek, Maranatha. That's where the word Maranatha comes from. And that is how the church greeted one another back in the day. They just said Maranatha. Whenever they saw one, someone or greeted a Christian and they were going down the pavement there in Ephesus and they greeted another Christian, they said Maranatha. O Lord, come. That is the way they would greet one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for this word here in the book of Corinth. We see that it was a church that has so many problems, so many issues. And, but in a sense, it gives us hope because it just so shows us that in the early church, there were issues already. There were problems, very much like today. And, and we see that the church or the people living 2,000 years ago, they weren't that different from us. They were our forefathers. They, they went through really much the very same things that we go through. It wasn't that much different. And so there were problems and there were practical answers for these problems. And I just pray that as we've been through this book that not only would we have been through the book, but the book would have been through us. I hope that we have all learned something from this and can take something home and apply it to our lives so that our lives become more productive and fruitful. In Jesus' name.